This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. So let us look at uh, uh, the labor question, because uh, this is a question, of course, for capital, but I think all, from the standpoint of uh, any anti-capitalist politics, uh, we have to think about uh, exactly what's happening uh, within uh, the sphere of labor in, in, in China. In uh, 1978, when Deng Xiaoping launched the, 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 the transformation, uh, the labor situation was roughly as follows. Uh, China had industrialized largely under Soviet influence after the revolution. And industrial organization uh, involved, of course, uh, the creation of what might be called a working class, uh, which was focused on heavy industry, uh, steel and uh, you know, transportation and the, uh, and, and the like. And uh, the organization was not uh, what might be called horizontal in the sense that all workers were together. Uh, it was more uh, sort, of, sort of localized in work units, uh, in particular uh, plants that were, create, were manufactured. For example, you have a steel plant and there would be work units in the steel plant, and the workers in that in that work unit uh, would uh, be uh, living under circumstances which were fairly secure in terms of their employment. Uh, there would be a housing attached to it, education, services, and the like. So you had, in effect, what might be called a socialist working class, you know, working in the state-owned uh, uh, enterprises. And the state-owned enterprises were uh, connected uh, to regional economies, uh, and uh, it was uh, a centrally planned uh, structure in terms of, uh, in a classic kind of Soviet uh, sense, that uh, different enterprises had different uh, production targets, and, uh, uh, and this was worked through in this way. But that was uh, uh, an urbanized working class, which let's call it a socialist working class. Uh, it was embedded in, in, in that uh, centrally planned uh, economic system. But the mass of the population, uh, of course, was living on the land. Uh, and this was uh, a population that had a very difficult uh, uh, time uh, reproducing itself uh, adequately. Uh, the uh, tendency in the Mao era was to go for uh, communal agricultural systems, and so uh, the agricultural system was uh, uh, organized uh, according to on a commune basis, uh, and it was not uh, very successful. And the, during the Mao period, there were all these attempts to find different ways to increase uh, uh, sort of rural productivity, which were not uh, terribly successful. Now, one of the things that happened uh, almost fortuitously in, in 1978 uh, was that uh, China was living under conditions of uh, uh, very marginal uh, capacity for food production. And again, this comes back to the decentralized character of uh, uh, this centralized uh, state apparatus that in a certain part of China, uh, a group of people got together and said basically the communal system wasn't working. They wanted to actually uh, revolt against it, and they started to organize agriculture on the basis of what was called a household responsibility. That is, uh, you individualized uh, the, 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 the labor process. And again, this is where, again, you have to appreciate uh, the nature of the adaptability of the Central Committee uh, who, who looked at the situation saying agricultural productivity is very low. Uh, in this place, uh, these people went off and started uh, using a, a household responsibility system and productivity uh, increased dramatically. Uh, 
Uh, so we'll basically adopt the household responsibility system. So in 1978, a lot of the communes got dissolved and displaced by a household responsibility system. <clears throat> Agricultural productivity uh, soared upwards, and uh, th this was uh, therefore uh, a revolution uh, on the land. And uh, but then well, most of the data suggests that by 1984, the rise in productivity. Uh, had uh, shot itself out, and uh, the, after that, there was then going to be serious problems uh, of uh, employment on, on, on the land. Now, introducing competition in, in the state-owned enterprises uh, immediately put them in a uh, sort of uh, up against the wall in terms of uh, how productive they were and, uh, and how the economy was, uh, was going to be worked. And uh, what, in effect, happened was that uh, the uh, privileged uh, socialist workers in the state-owned enterprises found themselves more and more under threat as the state-owned enterprises went bankrupt or, in a whole series of, uh, uh, of reorganizations, were transformed into the equivalent of more capitalist-style corporations that simply hired in workers and dissolved uh, the work unit, uh, and therefore smashed what was called the Iron Rice Bowl, which was the, uh, if you like, the, the security apparatus that supported the, the lives of uh, this population. So the, the, the employees in the state-owned uh, enterprises found themselves less and less privileged over time. And I think it's kind of interesting to note that this was, of course, the same period when a privileged, uh, mainly white, uh, unionized working classes in the United States and uh, the equivalent uh, in Europe found themselves under pressure from deindustrialization and from attacks upon trade union power and attacks upon uh, the privileges of that sector of the working class. So, in exactly the same way that uh, a working class uh, found itself um, being sort of uh, suffering from deindustrialization. So you actually get a whole wave of deindustrialization in China. Uh, this is again something that is kind of not not appreciated. That China, that that the China. Now most of these industries were located in the north, and uh, there are tales of deindustrialized cities that look, look like Detroit, uh, where uh, you know these privileged workers are laid off. They have no alternative employment. Uh, there was a lot of unrest. There was, uh, you know, revolt to some degree uh, against uh, uh, what was happening to the state-owned enterprises. So they were being pushed to to to, to one to one side. Now, in 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 the south of China, on the other hand, and and and, and on the in the coastal re regions also, what you started to find was the emergence of of uh, uh, township and, and 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 village enterprises. In effect, what happened with the, the dissolution of the communes and, and the rising agricultural productivity was that there was surplus capital on the land, and the surplus capital uh, started to be used uh, to create uh, uh, small enterprises, which which started to to uh, uh, produce things and be become productive. And it was at this moment, uh, in the 1980s, where uh, the, the the economy of China was opened up to. Uh, to foreign influences, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, allowing foreign companies to come in. Now, here is, this, again, an interesting kind of story that uh, foreign direct investment into China started to emerge in the 1980s as a possibility. But in the first instance, it was just not any foreign direct investment. It was uh, particularly direct investment from Taiwan, and particularly direct investment from Hong Kong, and to some degree also, as time went on, foreign direct investment from other Asiatic companies like South Korea, uh, Japan, and the like. Uh, obviously, Hong Kong entrepreneurs who had built the Hong Kong economy along capitalistic lines then looked at what was going on in South China as a free, low-income peasant population that could be mobilized as a migrant labor force uh, into their production. So they took a lot of their production 
uh, in Hong Kong and relocated it into into Guangdong and Pearl River Delta and Shenzhen and 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 the like. So you suddenly find this, and 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 the same thing happened with Taiwanese capital, which 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 started to flow into uh, into China uh, very 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 quickly. And w what happened was that many of these uh, industries. Uh, had uh, a supply chain of some kind, and so small enterprises would come up, and they would uh, they would you know, you know, start producing the supply. Uh, to the, so you, you start to get a complicated kind of network of of uh, yeah, industrial structure emerging, mainly in the south. And the Chinese government facilitated that by creating enterprise zones. So they had about five particular dis you know, areas where. Uh, anything was allowed, uh, and uh, but it was kind of insulated from the rest of society. So you had this kind of uh, control, and and at that point you start to see the formation of a migrant labor force, uh, which is being extracted off the land and, and turned into, uh, and and the labor force needs somewhere to live. <clears throat> so that when start to you get the push into urbanization, and the labor force uh, also. Uh, ends up ends up uh, creating an alternative uh, labor supply system, uh, which might be called the dormitory labor or something of that kind. That that uh, typically recruiters would go into rural areas, would recruit a lot of laborers, bring them in. Uh, there would be dormitories constructed so they could live in the dormitories. Uh, and they lived in the dormitories, did the production, and they maybe would do that for five or six years, and then they would re return back to the countryside. This is particularly true for young women. Uh, and in the textiles and the areas of that kind, uh, this would be the typical pattern, that 16-year-old that, uh, uh, girls would be brought in, living in the dormitories. Um, at, at age 25, they you know, would leave and go back to the countryside, get married, and all, all, all the rest of it. Now... This labor, this, there was this huge uh, supply of labor uh, power. And this had a lot to do with what had happened during the Mao period. Uh, during the Mao period, you see, uh, you know, there were all these kind of tragedies in the Mao period, uh, famines and things like that, but, one, but there were also some very, very positive things. For instance, a dramatic decrease uh, in infant mortality. Uh, and uh, the the result was uh, that by the time you get into the, about the 1980s, uh, you have a huge wave of young people who are coming into the you know sort of labor force, uh, and they need something to do. And what's going to happen? And now the the one child policy, which the government set up, uh, had come in rather late in that process. So in a sense, you have a demographic situation in which this vast wave of uh, of, of a cohort, as it were, of labor is is flooding into China, and there has to be some way taken to absorb it. And so the labor absorption thing became very, very significant uh, in the 1980s. Uh, and then it connected also to labor absorption through urbanization in the 1990s, uh, which then, as I've mentioned, in 2007-2008 turned into further labor absorption through urbanization. So you're absorbing all of this labor, and most of this is going on in the south of China and the coastal regions of China in township and village enterprises, some state-owned enterprises, but ultimately, of course, private capital is also coming in, and so you get uh, an entrepreneurial kind of, uh, of, of capital. This is a, a low-wage labor force, a migrant labor force, which is precarious in the sense that it does not have citizenship rights in the cities. Uh, and this is this is the kind of the very peculiar thing because they're a migrant force. They're not considered as, if you like, citizens of the city. They're considered as a migrant labor force that will then go back to the land uh, after it has, uh, you know, done its time, as it were, working in the in, in in the factories. So there's this very peculiar kind of system set up. Um, and and uh, there's a very interesting kind of. Uh, 
uh, work by uh, C.K. Lee, who talks about uh, uh, the, the dual labor system that, that emerged in China. There was the northern labor system, if you want to call it that, which was the socialist workers who, who had been laid, laid off and, who, and, and were essentially engaging in a politics of discontent uh, of, uh, 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 and, and, and mourning the loss, if you like, of their privileges and, and of their possibilities but who considered themselves to be socialist workers. The migrants in the South did not consider themselves to be workers. Uh, I, I found this fascinating. I remember giving a talk there in a, in a, in a sort of a, 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 a social action center. <coughs> center. <coughs> and I started talking about to the people as if they were of the working class. And these were migrant workers. And they all said, no, we're not, we're not, we're not working class. We're workers. We're we're migrants, and and uh, you know, and the, the working class has nothing to do with us. The working class are those privileged people who live in the cities. We don't have permanent residency uh, uh, for 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 the cities. We we're we're just sort of migrant laborers who are kind of passing through. And this was the this was the situation uh, in 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 the work process. Now, as this uh, system uh, matured. A number of things started to happen. The first thing was that the first wave of migrants from the from from the rural areas came in, and they had absolutely no idea uh, of their rights. It's it was a classic case of what Marx would call of a of a class in itself. That is, it's it, it's actually the working class objectively, but it has no consciousness of its positionality in society as being a working class and doesn't think of itself as working class. And so when I talked to people in that situation as if they were of the working class, they literally did not understand me. I didn't understand what I was talking about, thought I was talking about something completely different. They didn't think that I was talking about anything to do with them. And, and this, this working class uh, began to be regulated by very local uh, decisions made by local politicians and local authorities. <clears throat> and a, a system emerged where the central state uh, would pass a labor law. And the labor law was actually, you know, in some respects, fairly progressive. But the point was that no, none of the migrant workers knew about the labor law. They didn't know that they had a right of contract. They didn't know what that contractual situation should be. And if, they were, if something terrible happened and they complained to the authorities, if they didn't have a contract, they had no grounds to litigate at all. So you have this peculiar kind of uh, situation in which uh, an objective working class is there, migrant, you know, and all kinds of awful things are happening to it because, and here I think I would use the sort of classic Marxist phrase, the coercive laws of competition. As soon as China inserted itself into the world market, it had to obey by the, the coercive laws of competition. And the coercive laws of competition were such as to say, you know, we the only way in which China can succeed in the world economy is through a low-wage economic system and a low-wage industrial structure. And that is what, of course, emerged in South China. And pretty soon you start to see these large factories being set up. Foreign capital is coming in. And as I've indicated, the first wave of that foreign capital was, wasn't that foreign because it was Taiwanese or, 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 uh, or from Hong Kong. And, 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 but in a sense, uh, those capitalist organizations which were coming in saw China as a place where they could actually engage in all kinds of predatory practices, all kinds of exploitative practices. Uh, the coercive laws of competition were such that they could utilize this low-wage labor force in any way they wanted because it was ignorant of its legal rights local authorities were not going to actually intervene and were not going to do anything because local authorities very often were rather corruptly connected to uh, these uh, foreign 
uh, firms coming in and the local startups that were also uh, becoming uh, integrated into into this uh, into this system. So the labour situation then, uh, however, began to change because uh, after the first cohort of workers went back into the countryside, they started to actually alert people who were the next cohort of workers coming in as to what kinds of conditions they might like they might uh, encounter as they got recruited into into the factories, and they started to become more aware of uh, their contractual rights. And in 1995, then there was this first uh, labour law, and in 2007 2008 there was another big labor law, which is actually very progressive. It, it, you know, the, the, the central government was really concerned with the preservation of social harmony. And so it's built a labor law uh, which was around trying to protect the rights of, of workers uh, against the predatory practices that many of these foreign firms that were coming in were engaging in and many local entrepreneurs were engaging in. So, 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 so you have a, a labor situation of this kind, but there was no apparatus whereby uh, this law could be really fully implemented. And, and because there was no apparatus, uh, but people started to become aware of the fact that there was a law, they, they were aware of the fact that they should have contractual rights, they were being denied contractual rights, and so actually the law uh, had an immense impact on increasing discontent rather than resolving discontent. And there's some very interesting data about the, the state of mind. This is a book by, by Pun Yai about migrant labor in China. And let me read you to some of the things, because the Chinese were keeping official statistics on the levels of discontent that were, were occurring within the labor systems that, that they had set up. And, and official statistics, and I'm reading now from Pun Yai, revealed that between 1993 and 2005, the number of mass protests had ridden, risen nationwide from around 10,000 to 87,000, a nearly 20% annual increase on average. Also, the number of participants in these protests had increased from 730,000 to more than 3 million, and 75% of these protests were initiated by workers and peasants. It is observed that these protests have not only increased in number, but also in average size, social scope, and degree of organization. The upward trend continued from the first 10 years of the 2000s, reflecting widespread incidences of rights violations as the private sector expanded. Labor cases skyrocketed to 693,465, involving more than 1.2 million laborers nationwide during the economic crisis of 2008. Uh, and it was that was the period when uh, a lot of firms went bankrupt and uh, there was non-payment on wages. These were mainly disputes over wage and insurance payments, illegal layoffs, and inadequate compensation payments. Following the economic recovery, after 2008 that is, newly accepted arbitration cases fell to 600,000 in 2010 and further to 589,000 in 2011. In recent years, governments at all levels have directed workers to resolve conflicts through workplace-based mediation and other informal means, hence re reducing arbitration caseloads. In 2012, however, labor dispute cases rebounded to 641,000, showing deep tensions in industrial relations, despite great in greater intervention than ever before from the government and its trade union offices. Now, this is largely going on through the migrant populations uh, in, the, in the south and, and, and coastal regions. And this is, of course, a huge uh, outpouring of discontent uh, within the labor movement and within the labor movement. Now, China has uh, organized trade unions, but they're trade unions organized by the Communist Party. So they're party unions, and essentially the role of the union is to deal with discontent and to keep the lid on discontent. I mean, in other words, they're not about sort of challenging management. They're about challenging the labor to try to keep things, uh, keep, keep the peace. But what, what happened in this labor law 2007-2008 was people started to become very aware of their contractual rights 
and therefore uh, on, on their legal rights. What then happened was that, that, that given this volume of discontent, which you see, is that people started to make connections. And one of the things that Mao had not liked was this idea of any horizontal organization of working populations. In other words, the decentralization kept, if you like, discontent always bottled in local areas. And there was not, therefore, a mass movement, which was a sort of a mass Chinese labor movement of some kind, which was going to actually exert collective pressure. What happened was, uh, if you like, that, that, that mass discontent which, which has been recorded here, these numbers of, by the way, the Chinese government no longer produced these numbers because I think they're becoming so astronomical that they find them embarrassing. Um, but what we're, what, we're, what we're beginning to see is, is the possibility that there is a transformation going on in uh, what might be called a class in itself to what Marx called a class for itself, that there is the emergence of a certain kind of class consciousness. The unions, <clears throat> the trade unions which existed were uh, company unions, were, were, were party-organized company unions, and there is now a movement uh, which is uh, pushing towards uh, a uh, independent uh, unions, which are organised by the workers themselves uh, uh, according to their own interests. This is something which uh, obviously the party finds threatening, very threatening. Now, one of the things that we it is important to to to, to recognise, and this goes back to the way in which. <coughs> the Chinese uh, still honor the tradition of Marx, Lenin, Mao, and the like. <clears throat> because there are, in the educational process in China, lengthy kinds of courses on, on Marxism and Maoism and, and, and all the rest of it. And <coughs> while many Western commentators tend to think that these are you know, jokes, it turns out that they're actually rather, you know, some people take them seriously. And there is, a, if you like, a revival of Maoist thinking in, amongst students, and in exactly the same way that in Tiananmen Square, uh, you had that kind of coming together of a student movement and, and a worker movement uh, to sort of challenge the authority of the, of the party. So there seems to be a movement along those lines uh, emerging again, but now in a context where the laborers themselves are, I think, much more conscious of, uh, of their conditions and their rights. But most people writing about this have, have a very interesting, make a very interesting point, that the workers themselves have not, uh, are not antagonistic to the party. They're antagonistic to local administration of the party. And that the decentralization means that the discontents are still decentralized and they're no long, not directed immediately at the top of the party. And there's a very interesting phrase that I, I came across which kind of said, you know, the, the view from the workers' standpoint is that the, that the party is sacrosanct still. The Beijing... And, 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 and Xi's rhetoric, which is all about continuing in the Marxist tradition and all the rest of it, and they want to do good by the workers. And the, the law of 2007, 2008 did do well by the workers. So the central party is not at this point threatened because the main thing is against local repression and local venality and the particular corporate thing. The corp, you know, corporation. So it is still, and the second thing that is that is important is to say what are the demands about. Well, there are obvious demands about you know, uh, you know wage levels, and in fact, what's happened is that wage levels have risen significantly in the last three four years. But even more important, the main thing that seems to be the centre of working class discontent is that workers are not treated with dignity and respect. So the claim of dignity and respect is abs comes absolutely you know, central to what the class, which is beginning to become for itself, 
is beginning to articulate. Now, I've already kind of suggested in, in previous uh, commentary that China is moving from a low-wage kind of economy to a more value-added kind of territory of artificial intelligence and uh, high-tech and, and, and all the rest of it. And actually, what is beginning to happen is that low-wage labor is being taken out of China and goes elsewhere. There's offshoring going on from China into Thailand, into Cambodia, Laos, Southeast Asia, and Vietnam. And, and in fact, some of the low-wage labor, which is behind the export industries, which you know were very strong in this uh, before, is, is actually moving out of China. And at the same time, what we're beginning to see are these huge uh, kinds of uh, transformations. The one of the most interesting is to look very briefly at the question of Foxconn. Foxconn is a Taiwanese firm. It produces 50% of the world's computers, you know, iPhones, and, and all the rest of it. Foxconn is a Taiwanese company with big, and it, 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 it sets up a whole city in which production occurs uh, in Shenzhen, employing something like, uh, nobody quite knows how many people are employed in, in Foxconn City. It's between 250,000 or 400,000 people in one industrial complex. In 2011, there was a wave of suicides, worker suicides, which created all kinds of problems. I mean, when this became known, there was a lot of pressure on Apple to kind of say, hey, you've got to do something or other. So Foxconn itself is beginning to say, all right, they want to automate their factories. And Foxconn, of course, is beginning to export uh, its production activity all around the world, including, of course, now putting a, a, a factory in Wisconsin, where it's been given something like $4 billion to come in and, 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 and set up a factory. But it's going to be a, a high-tech factory, not uh, a, a high-level employment uh, factory. So this situation in China is, I think, potentially very interesting. Because the party, at some point or other, is going to have to deal with the question, the labor question. And to the degree that the working class movement becomes more and more conscious of itself and becomes a class in it, you know, a class for itself, we're likely to see a movement. Right now, there is also a connectivity of that movement with the student movement. So there are student movements now which are coming out of the Maoist tradition are actually together with. The party's response to this is repression. At this particular point, the students are being rounded up. There's a fear within the Communist Party of a repeat of Tiananmen Square. And uh, by the way, the one thing you can't mention in China is Tiananmen Square. If you talk about Tiananmen Square with young people, they don't know what you're talking about. It's complete <laughs> denial. But what we've seen just recently is, is the emergence of a demand for worker-controlled unions and support for that demand coming from student movement, students being arrested and disappearing, and immediately then international protests which are actually, you know, bringing uh, U.S. academics and all the rest of it into, into the picture uh, in terms of uh, protesting against uh, the treatment of this. So this is a crucial moment in terms of what the, how, how the politics of, of China might move. I, I'm not convinced that it is always going to come out pro-capitalist. I can see a situation in which a mass movement of workers and currents within the Communist Party who, who will kind of say, OK, look, and there are several local examples, by the way, where localities side with the workers against capital. 
and then others where it doesn't happen. So this is the kind of the situation. It's a tentative situation. At the same time, the whole economy of China is slowing down for all sorts of uh, reasons. And so the labor question, it seems to me, is the crucial thing that we might want to take a cognizance of. And it's the thing that's most difficult to find any information about because Chinese authorities are not very uh, interested in uh, conveying information so that we're mainly getting the kind of information we want out of Hong Kong and various other kind of social groups uh, who get into uh, trying to understand the conditions of labor in China. But in this sense, uh, I would argue that the future of capital is going to be very much dependent upon the kind of dynamic we see in China, but I think also the future possibilities for anti-capitalist politics uh, lie uh, very much uh, within the realm of what is happening to the labor movement uh, in China itself. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.